All right, we don't have too many more people coming on, so I think I'll, I'll start now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 22nd annual John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial Keynote event entitled Two Places, the Inside Room and the Outside Room. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Library Services at Roger Williams University. Thank you all so much for coming. Please note that this event is being recorded this evening. The John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial Program is presented this year in partnership with the Carson McCullers Center at Columbus State University in Georgia and includes, includes this evening's keynote event, a virtual exhibition and a smaller physical e exhibition mounted in the university library, both prepared by library staff and a book discussion at Bristol's Rogers Free Library. The annual program celebrates a great writer of literature and their body of work. This year's selection, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers, was selected by the university's Burst Committee with representation from Roger Williams faculty and staff and a member of the Rogers Free Library staff. The committee is chaired by Professor Adam Braver, who serves a dual role at RWU as a professor of creative writing and the library program director. Professor Braver will introduce this evening's esteemed panelists in just a moment. We are hugely grateful to Robert Blaze, an alumnus of Roger Williams, who with his gift to the university in the year 2000, made these events possible. Mr. Blaze's endowment was in honor of his mentor and friend, Professor John Howard Burst Jr., a scholar of Herman Melville and Walt Whitman and a collector of first editions. The Blaze gift supports an exhibition, a library book fund for collecting works related to the exhibit, travel for several Burst student fellows to archives and libraries associated with the book and a keynote event. And now I'd like to invite Professor Braver to introduce our panelists. Adam. Thank you, Betsy. Um, I also would like to thank Robert Blaze um, and his daughter, Jennifer Murphy, not only for their longstanding financial commitment to this program, but also to their ongoing passionate support and care for it. Um, in times such as these that we are witnessing nightly on our televisions, it is more important than ever to remember the power that literature has held over humankind for centuries. One that not only offers a refuge, but perhaps most importantly, enters into the mystery of the human experience and human consciousness, bringing understanding and perspective in ways that scholarship and rhetoric cannot always address. Um, I, for one, was so grateful to be reminded of this last Thursday when my class met to discuss Carson's story, A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud, followed by watching Karen's moving and lovely film adaptation of it. That beautiful short story that not only, that, that shows us not only the need for love, but within our most troubling moments, the conscious dedication it takes to embrace the love that is all around us starting in places such as, as the story tells us, a tree, a rock, or a cloud. We're so grateful for the partnership we've had with the Carson McCuller Center on this year's project. And I'm humbled to work with my colleagues who oversaw the digital exhibition on Carson, as well as its highlighted version on display in our library for those of you in the, the Rhode Island area. Um, so many thanks to Heidi Benedict, Christine Fagan, Chris Truskowski, and Liz Bataglia. And also thanks to Susan Tasson for her partnership in bringing the discussions into our local public library. And lastly, a special thanks to our two student burst fellows who traveled with me to Columbus, Georgia to research the archives, the history and Carson's Columbus and who brought everything they learned and so much more back to our team here, Paloma, Bellisi and Sam Treber. Now to this afternoon's program. Uh, please welcome our moderator, Nick Norwood, director of the Carson McCullers Center. And I'm thrilled that joining Nick is legendary Hollywood actors, Karen Allen, the world's foremost Carson McCullers scholar, Carlos Dews, and National Book Award finalist, Jen Chaplin. 
Yeah. Hey, Adam, thanks so much. And I want to just say uh, a thank you to you, Adam, and the other people on the committee for choosing Carson McCullers to be uh, this year's focus of the uh, Burris Memorial uh, Program. Uh, we are t uh, thrilled, of course, at the Carson McCullers Center that you chose Carson, and it was great for you guys to come here. Uh, and I was, you know, uh, I had a, a good time showing you all um, Carson's house and everything in Columbus. So that was wonderful. Um, thanks also to my friends on the panel today for joining us. It's good to see you all. And, uh, you know, we, uh, it's always a, a pleasure to get together with other lovers of Carson McCullers um, to talk about Carson and her work. So thanks for being here today. And uh, let's just jump right in. I want to start by asking each of you to say a word about how you first came to the work of Carson McCullers. And Karen, uh, I'd like to start with you, if we could. So uh, if you could just tell, you've told me the story, but but for our audience, uh, would you say a word about how you first came to the work of Carson McCullers? I read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, I think when I was maybe 17 or 18 years old, and I was so taken by her work and by the incredible um, depth of it and um, that I just developed this appetite to read everything she had ever written. Um, and I just began to read, I think I read Member the Wedding next. And then I think I also, there were two films of her work that were out at the time, um, Heart is Lonely Hunter and Member the Wedding. I saw the films. Um, and then I started in on the short stories and the poems and, um, and just fell head over heels in love with her work. Um, yeah. it, it had made a huge, huge, profound impression on me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carlos, how about you? Thanks, Nick. Um, well, I uh, first encountered uh, Carson's work when I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas at Austin, when a friend gave me some photocopied pages, uh, selections from various books, thinking that I might uh, like her work. And I've never had an experience, had never had an experience before and haven't since uh, of an identification with the writer and feeling like that the, this writer had really sort of tapped into my own experience and was representing uh, the things that I had struggled with in my life up to that uh, up to that point. And you know, Emily Dickinson said that she knows something is poetry when it feels like the top of her head has been taken off. And I really felt like that when I first read uh, Carson's work. And it sort of animated and sustained my you know, personal life and my certainly my academic career ever since. Yeah. And Jen, you have written about this um, in your book, My Autobiography of uh, Carson McCullers. But if you would say a word about how you first came to the work of Carson McCullers. Sure. Um, well, I'm by no means an expert on Carson's work or her life. Um, and I feel like I came to her work almost by accident, um, by way of the archive at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. So also at the University of Texas. Um, I came across, uh, while I was working as an intern there, a set of letters that Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach had written to Carson. And I recognized in them immediately a queer relationship. Um, I was in the process of coming out as a queer woman at the time. And I just wanted to know more about these two women. Who were they? What was this relationship? So at that point, I started reading Carson's fiction. I started reading the biographies that have been written about her. I ended up cataloging her uh, clothes and personal effects, household items at the Ransom Center, um, and then stayed in her childhood home at the McCullers Center for writers and musicians in Columbus. Um, and that's where, Nick, you led me to uh, Dr. Mary Mercer's archives, um, where I kind of found documents that really helped provide some insight into the questions that I originally had when I found those letters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I also uh, asked you all to come today with something, a short passage from McCullers um, to read for us, something that means something to you. And so before we get too far uh, into this conversation, I'd like to take some time to do that. So Karen, uh, I think uh, you had a piece that you wanted to read. You want to read that now and, and say something about why this piece and, and what it means to you? Well, you know, I again, I, I rather stumbled upon this poem um, 
which is in Carlos's book. I don't know if it's, uh, is this Carlos's book? This is, is this your book? Oh, maybe not. Which one is that? The Library of America? The Mortgaged Heart. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's the one that Carson's sister, Rita. Uh-uh, edited. okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't, I don't remember when or how I stumbled on this poem, but at some point I started reading the poems and this poem just grab me. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting, my relationship to her work in the sense that I don't know how easy it is to put into words what it is about some, not some, all of her writing. Um, but, but there are certain things. This is a poem called When We Are Lost. When we are lost, what image tells? Nothing resembles nothing. Yet nothing is not blank. It is configured hell of noticed clocks on winter afternoons, malignant stars, demanding furniture, all unrelated and with air in between. The terror, is it of space, of time, or the joined trickery of both conceptions? To the lost, transfixed among the self-inflicted ruins, all that is non-air, if this indeed is not deception, is agony immobilized. While time, the endless idiot, runs screaming around the world. Great. It seems very of these times as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, I was I was thinking as you were reading that, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the album of Carson McCullers reading her own works. She reads mostly from Member of the Wedding, but she reads that poem. She does? So, yeah, so you should, I, I'll send it to you because it is very interesting, her reading of the poem, but yeah. Oh, would you? I'd love that. That's wonderful. Carlos, um, would you read something and tell us uh, why you've chosen this piece? Um, as you know, Nick, I had the privilege of uh, editing Carson's complete works for the Library of America in two volumes. And when the first volume came out, which was her complete novels, um, it was only two months after the terrorist attacks on September 11 in 2001. And the 92nd Street Y in New York held an event uh, to launch the uh, collection. And they had a number of writers like Hilton Owls and Francine Prose, I think. um, uh, And I was asked to read a passage. And given what had just happened uh, a couple of months before, I chose a passage that um, appears near the end of her last novel, Clock Without Hands. And it's strange that it seems, again, given what's going on in the world and uh, uh, in, in Ukraine, it seems appropriate, again, to, uh, to read it tonight. So this is a passage near the very end of Clock Without Hands, when the protagonist of the novel, Jester Klein, is taking his uh, airplane up into the sky. Looking downward from an altitude of 2,000 feet, the earth assumes order. A town, even Milan, is symmetrical, exact as a small gray honeycomb, complete. The surrounding terrain seems designed by a law more just and mathematical than the laws of property and bigotry a dark parallelogram of pine woods, square fields, rectangles of sward. On this this cloudless day, the sky on all sides and above the plain is a blind monotone of blue, impenetrable to the air and the imagination. But down below, the earth is round. The earth is finite. From this height, you do not see man and the details of his humiliation. The earth from a great distance is perfect and whole, but this is an order foreign to the heart. And to love the earth, you must come closer. Gliding downward low over the town and countryside, the whole breaks up into a multiplicity of impressions. The town is much the same in all its seasons, but the land changes. In early spring, the fields here are like patches of worn gray corduroy, each one alike. Now you could begin to tell the crops apart, the gray green of cotton, the dense and spidery tobacco land, the burning green of corn. As you circle inward, the town itself becomes crazy and complex. You see the secret corners of all the sad backyards, 
gray fences, factories, the flat main street. From the air, men are shrunken and they have an automatic look like wound up dolls. They seem to move mechanically among haphazard miseries. You do not see their eyes. And finally, this is intolerable. The whole earth from a great distance means less than one look into a pair of human eyes, even the eyes of the enemy. Yeah, that's great. You know, it, 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 uh, you've convinced me, Carlos. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that McCullers has several set pieces. I mean, there's the famous Lover Beloved, and there's the famous uh, The We of Me. Uh, and, and, you know, you've convinced me that's yet another of the great set pieces in McCullers and it really stands out. I mean, I think that book is underappreciated, but that, that passage really stands out in that book, uh, as one of her great, uh, set pieces of writing. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and Jen, I think you wanted to read something from member of the wedding. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and read it first and then kind of describe why I chose it, but I think we're all kind of thinking along similar lines uh, with the choices of readings today. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So this is from member of the wedding. Um, Frankie stood looking up and down the four walls of the room. She thought of the world and it was fast and loose and turning faster and looser and bigger than ever it had been before. The pictures of the war sprang out and clashed together in her mind. She saw bright flowered islands and a land by a northern sea with the gray waves on the shore, bombed eyes and the shuffle of soldiers' feet, tanks and a plane, wing broken, burning and downward falling in a desert sky. The world was cracked by the loud battles and turning a thousand miles a minute. The names of places spun in Frankie's mind, China, Peachville, New Zealand, Paris, Cincinnati, Rome. She thought of the huge and turning world until her legs began to tremble and there was sweat on the palms of her hands. But still, she did not know where she should go. Finally, she stopped looking around the four kitchen walls and said to Bernice, I feel just exactly like somebody has peeled all the skin off me. I wish I had some cold, good chocolate ice cream. And I that passage just popped into my mind last week, uh, the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, something about seeing the map at the top of the New York Times of the bombings just immediately brought to mind Frankie's sense of overwhelm um, that kind of follows almost immediately on hearing about World War II on the radio, but also adjusting to the reality of her brother's marriage. So basically mm. the reality that the world around her is changing and it feels threatening and she's helpless to stop it. And I think McCullers really captures that childlike confusion, integrating that new information into her life in that passage. But it also resonates with me as an adult kind of encountering this news in such a rapid technological landscape in 2022. And, and so the feelings she describes are so vivid and they describe feelings that I've had, but haven't really been able to articulate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting um, how all of us are, are moving towards this, this sort of next question that I wanted to ask, which is, um, uh, Jen, if, if you recommended to someone right now, uh, oh, you should read Carson McCullers. And they said, why should I read Carson McCullers right now? Why should I be reading someone who's been dead for 55 years and whose works were written, you know, 70 to 80 years ago? What would you say to them? I think, I mean, exactly what I just said about describing certain feelings that are, are so common, uh, but so difficult to articulate. I know that I still read and talk about McCullough's work because it had such a huge impact on my life. It helped me understand the complexities of identity, of desire, and my life would have unfolded just completely differently if I'd read her work earlier in high school or college, or if I'd never come across it at all. Um, so there's something just about the empathy she displays for her characters on the page that I found when I first read her so completely validating. And I know many other readers feel the same way. Yeah. Um, Karen or Carlos, do you have thoughts on that? If, if you were recommending McCullers to someone and they ask, why now? Why read Carson McCullers right now? What would you say, do you think? Um, you know, I... Uh... 
I'm approaching you know 40 years uh, since I first discovered uh, Carson and having spent so much time you know teaching her work and thinking about her work and writing about uh, her work I I've really sort of sort of distilled all of my thoughts on what she was trying to do in her work down to a single word um, and it and it's the word empathy that because of her own experience growing up and uh, the sensitivity that she seemed to be born with um, she had the ability to sort of feel for other people and along with other people. And it seems that now I can't read her work without thinking, seeing almost every page, an effort on her part to teach people how to be empathetic toward other people. Uh, I also study uh, Buddhism and, you know, she becomes more Buddhist the more I read her uh, as well. Um, that, that her project seems to have been to demonstrate not only why people are deserving of empathy, but how one can even, like she says, the passage I read ends with even in the eyes of the enemy, uh, teaching people to be uh, empathetic, even toward the people that you would most likely not be able to be. Um, so I think that's, that's a reason to read her uh, today, if for no other uh, reason. Okay. Karen, how interesting, because I know you know a lot about Buddhism as well. And so what do you think? What would you say to someone? Uh, why read Carson McCullers now? Um, I think that it is and continues to be for me, because I continue to read her, it, it, there's a constant elevation of, of, of all of these qualities that we struggle with as human beings. There's a way of looking at them in this sort of full spectrum that she, she creates in her writing where, where she, she's just dealing with a lot of the real human, the, the big and the small struggles mm. that we all share as human beings. And I think that when, you, when I read her, I feel lifted up by it. I feel lifted up by someone who is seeing in the way that she saw and able to articulate it and, and share her, her, it's empathy and it's also just understanding her kind of clarity in a sense yeah. of, of, of seeing, you know, uh, it, 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 it amazes me when I read her writing um, that she had this, perception of the world yeah no it's true i had a uh, I gave a house tour um this past weekend to a uh, a book club who had just read the heart is a lonely hunter and we were marveling at how does someone that young uh you know have that sort of understanding and perception about people and uh, be able to imagine herself into the lives of people who are so different from her it's astonishing isn't it yeah, it is. It really is. I mean, yeah. the characters in, a, heart, in um, a Tree of Rocket Cloud that she's writing sort of through the eyes of this sort of ancient man who is sharing like all of his struggles to this young boy. It's mm -hmm. extraordinary that she yeah. had the, uh, and it's totally authentic. It doesn't feel forced in any way. It feels like she really was living and breathing through mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Well, now you you all have been to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, in fact, you've all stayed in the Smith McCullers house. Um, and so how much um, uh, do we attribute, you think, to, uh, to Car um, Carson's writing, the fact that she grew up in the South and maybe even a place like Columbus, Georgia? I mean, do you think what impact do you think that had? Well, I, I certainly don't think she would be the same writer and certainly wouldn't have had the same concerns that she had had she grown up in some place other than uh, than Columbus, because I can't separate uh, the things that she's concerned about in the world from what she saw when she was uh, when she was growing up. I mean, the Jim Crow South of that time is uh, is maybe the most important influence on her work. And the, and the fact that the, the poverty that she witnessed uh, because of the laborers uh, in the mills who worked there in, in Columbus, uh, to the treatment of uh, African-American people that she saw every day on the streets of Columbus and 
for, uh, for example, the young women who uh, sometimes work for her, her family, their mistreatment as well. Not only the segregation that she saw right in front of her uh, eyes uh, every day, and the treatment of difference um, with disdain uh, across the board that she saw. Um, you know, some people would uh, would find the, you know the South a difficult place to live in today, but uh, the South that she grew up in was a completely different matter. I mean, it was a very difficult place uh, for her to grow up, especially as someone who felt herself queer, uh, to feel outside, to feel different, and to be sort of fed that message constantly. Um, and I think attribute it to the place that she was growing up in, that it was imbued with this uh, sort of um, uh, indifference at best and hatred at worst, uh, and not just for her and her difference, but for any other kind of difference, be it racial difference, be it a class difference. Um, so I, I can't separate the two. I mean, you know, her, her consciousness seems to be uh, intimately connected with that place. Uh, you can't separate them out. And look at how few work she said outside of the South is right. a sign of that. I think, I think her imagination was born and lived the rest of her life in, uh, in Columbus, Georgia. Right. Well, she has that statement where she says, um, when do the flowers bloom and what flowers? Right. In other words, I wouldn't if I were writing about it in any other place, I wouldn't know what I was talking about. But but I do think it like you're you're pointing out that there's something more to it. And, and I'm curious, though, Jen, when you were here and you came to Columbus, Georgia, um, I mean, what was your feeling about that? You, you said, yeah, I can believe that Carson McCullers came out of this place. Or were you surprised that Carson McCullers came out of this place? I mean, how did you feel about it? Well, I imagine that Columbus today is quite a bit different com from Columbus in McCullers own time. But thinking about this question, I was really focused on the impact that her community had on her and her writing kind of once Carson was a writer. And I know from reading Illumination and Night Glare, the autobiography, from reading the therapy transcripts with Mary Mercer, that the reaction of her community to her writing did have a big impact on her physical and mental health. Um, she talks about basically going unconscious for several days after someone from the KKK calls after the publication of Reflections in a Golden Eye, which was later diagnosed as her first stroke. Um, and she was seen, especially when she kind of came back to Columbus, um, usually because, you know, her health was a struggle, she would return mm -hmm. uh, frequently home. She was seen as such an outsider, kind of like a traitor to the community for things like wearing pants or smoking cigarettes or typing mm -hmm. on a typewriter. Um, but in addition to those kind of more almost mundane ways that she was sort of rejected or, or felt rejection from the community, she was definitely uh, just so extraordinarily brave to be writing about the realities of white supremacy and the complexity and violence of race relations at a time when eugenicist ideas were in the mainstream, mm -hmm. um, just as she was brave to write about queer relationships and desire when homosexuality was actively persecuted by the U.S. government, policed by U.S. citizens. So given her identity, given her subject matter, it's no wonder to me that she felt from an early age, a need to get out of there, but at the same time that she couldn't kind of detach herself, that she couldn't stop writing about what she had experienced there and the way that place continued to act on her, even when she was a wildly successful writer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Karen, by the way, Jen is talking about that very thing that you were asking uh, Carlos to relate again, uh, you know, when she wrote A Tree of Rock and Cloud, that was all happening at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. She published uh, Reflections in a Golden Eye. The KKK called the house. Uh, I won't repeat what they said, but it was racist and homophobic at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, I, you know, Carlos can, can say more about this, but I believe that was when she had her first stroke. I mean, that seems to be when she had her first stroke. And when she came out of it in that front bedroom, she wrote a tree of rock a cloud. I mean, it, that's just amazing. And I remember I didn't know all of that. I, I, I guess I'd forgotten it. And you asked when you were there, where did she write that story? And so I did some research. And I went, oh, right there in the front bedroom. So mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, you, because you, you said we, we were just talking earlier when you made your film, uh, you filmed it in uh, Massachusetts. Yeah. And I remember talking to you about um, do you do you feel that this needs to be a southern setting? And you said, no, I think it could take place anywhere. But but do you think that's in true about McCullough's writing in general or maybe just that story? 
I don't think it's true about her writing in general, but I do, f- I felt when I read the story. So I, I remember having gone back and, and, and read it and I've seen some other versions of the film that were made uh, many mm-hmm. years ago. And I think it was initially set in a little bit more of an urban a little bit more of an urban feeling, more of a diner than the kind of uh, uh, place where I I set it, uh, which is more like a cafe. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, because the story itself is so encapsulated, I mean, the world, the world is completely, I, I chose in the film to spend a little bit of time outside with the boy on, on his journey to the cafe, just so we got a feeling not so much for the world around him, but for his world and mm. the way in which he related to the world. Um, I felt that, you know, whereas her story doesn't start until he walks into the cafe. Um, but no, I really didn't feel as though, uh, I, I felt like the, in Tree Rock a Cloud, it's a very internal world. Um, I mean, so, And I didn't feel like there were any direct references in the story to where it was taking place. And so I felt I had a little bit of freedom to to shoot it here. And because, you know, we were we were it's just it's just the way that that the whole thing kind of grew out of my Mm -hmm. desire to do it. And the actors I wanted to work with were here. And um, uh, it felt like. It was a very intimate way to tell the story. We didn't have to, I drove 20 minutes to the set every morning. Right. But it had right. this very intimate, close feeling. Um, a lot of the actors stayed at the at my house. And you know, yeah. so yeah. we had a, we had that kind of uh, yeah. intimacy. But but you think in general it is important that Carson McCullers came from the South. I mean, that the, the South had a big influence on her work. And you know, you were here in Columbus. Absolutely. Were you surprised I, by Columbus or or did it did it sort of meet your expectation of the place where Carson well, McCullers you know, grew up? I, ca- I came in a very particular time because it was during the hundred year uh, celebration of Carson's life. And I think it was sort of an overwhelming experience for me to be there to be in the house, to be there within the celebration uh, and watching what everyone was doing in order to celebrate. And the, the evening of the celebration was extraordinary. And then you're, you know, I was feted as were the, you know, the whole group of us by your wonderful friends, so many different artists. So my experience of Columbus, it felt like I was in a little bit of a bubble, bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, when I was in the house, I felt very, very moved by being in the house. And I spent a lot of time with, with the photographs and with her books and with her, her things and just sort of really taking it in. But I, I couldn't articulate any better than what Jen and, and Carlos mm-hmm. said in terms of, of uh, the impact uh, yeah. that, that that world had on her development yeah. as a writer and as a person. Mm-hmm. Extraordinary. Um, well, uh, Carlos and Jen, you've already mentioned, um, you know, something about Carson's sexuality, and you know that that article, uh, one of the articles that you wrote uh, right after the founding of the center, at Carlos, um, I think it was a piece for uh, a piece for a, a local magazine here in Columbus, and you describe uh, Carson in that piece as bisexual. Um, I mean, w- if we come back to that, is that the term that you would use now? And ha- how, what effect do you think that had on Carson's writing? Well, I, I don't think I would use that term anymore. And part of it is uh, thanks to the influence of Jen and her very deep thinking about uh, about Carson's identity and how we relate our own identity uh, to our uh, uh, perception of her, uh, her identity. And I think... Um, uh, those labels are are sort of tricky and in some ways reductive, um, and that you know describing her perhaps at one point as as bisexual was almost a sort of numbers game of looking at the you know the people that she had been in love with, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, that she had been in love with both men and women uh, during her life. I think you know uh, following maybe Jen's cue, 
Today, I would uh, probably describe her because it's purposefully and wonderfully and richly uh, ambiguous term, I would call her queer because it does it, it defies categorization to some extent uh, uh, in the way that bisexual or, or homosexual or gay or other sort of more rigid uh, terms uh, would. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful piece that appeared about Carson in the New Yorker a few years ago by uh, uh, Sarah Schulman. And she tries to trace in particular Carson's sensitivity regarding race um, and you know, traces it back to her own experience feeling uh, a young uh, uh, queer person in Columbus, Georgia, and that the necessary sensitivity that she had to her own status as an outsider or other or one who's hated by her community or whatever um, is, uh, you know, is seen as the sort of origin of her, in her ability to uh, think and feel the way she did at such a young age about people who, because of their race, had been uh, uh, had been uh, hated and, and despised. Um, it's a wonderful piece. I think it's called White Writer, um, mm -hmm. is right. what it's called. And um, so I, I think her sexuality uh, is as important to uh, uh, her her gender and sexual identity. Let's say is as important in. Um, uh, in shaping her as a writer as, you know, Columbus is as a place in shaping her as a writer. But I think you can't separate those two, her place and her identity and her struggles with identity and, and her places struggle with her own identity. I don't think you can separate them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Jen, uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, and, and I think kind of pivoting to think about the work a little bit, her, her books all to me center around desire, longing, and human relationships. Carlos, in a conversation we had once, you said her great subject was love. Um, and that still kind of resonates with me as a good, you know, reminder of why, why it's important to investigate and try to understand her, her sexuality, her identity, and what love really meant to her. Um, but some of her books deal explicitly with queer sexualities, like Reflections in a Golden Eye, Clock Without Hands, and some have like a much more ambiguous relationship to sexuality. Um, but queerness has been ascribed to her fiction for decades by readers and critics, um, mm. sort of a queer sensibility. And so it was so interesting to me in, in the research and, and in the process of getting acquainted with the archives in Columbus to see that to learn some of the backstory of those letters with Anne Marie the, in the therapy transcripts, to read the love letters between Carson and Mary that are in the archives at Columbus State, um, learning more about how she understood Reeves' sexuality, his queerness, his self hatred, um, and then hearing Carson wrestle with the label lesbian in those therapy transcripts um, and try to understand the nature of her own desires. All of this kind of validated for me what was evident in the fiction as a queer reader. None of it was really a surprise, but it was also um, something I didn't expect to be there in archival document form necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think it's so valuable to think about that. Um, and I mean, that's kind of why I wrote a whole book about it, um, mm -hmm. to think about her relationships with women and to think about her queer identity, um, especially when approaching her work when I think about what it would mean to young readers or to anyone questioning their identity to know here is like a great American mid-century writer who was also queer. Like if you can hold those two things together and then approach your work, I think that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and Karen, you and I have talked about this before, but that same uh, writer that Carlos was just talking about, Sarah Schulman, she thinks she she said her uh, when we were in Rome uh, at the conference that that Carlos put on and uh, she was asked, what's your favorite uh, McCullers piece? Uh, and she's somebody who's written a lot about Carson McCullers and has written a whole novel that's based on Carson's life and a play and so forth. And she said, A Tree of Rock the Cloud. And we had just watched your film the night before. And she says, um, you know, that she 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 says that the fact that the, the science, another one of those great set pieces comes around to people start at the wrong end of love. They start with the love of a woman. Right. And Sarah believes that this is coming out of her queerness that she would say this, but I don't know. What do, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I, I, I suppose in a way, you know, I don't necessarily myself interpret it 
that way. I mean, I think he says that because he is a man talking about his own experience. I mean, I think in, in the story, there's a specificity to, to the fact that he describes it, he says, a, a woman. Um, yeah. I think really the, the story to me is sort of, it sort of breaks gender in a sense. It's really yeah. not about gender at all as it's so much is it's about he, the humanness of us all. Mm -hmm. And that, that we have been in a sense taught to think of love as something outside of ourselves that is to be acquired and held as opposed to, something inside of ourselves that is to be offered and acknowledged and nurtured. And um, I, I guess I have always seen it in a much more philosophical sense that doesn't really, I, I don't see the, the story necessarily dealing with those issues myself, <laughs> but, but I, you know, it could certainly be interpreted that way. Could, uh, could it have been that it was a woman who was saying that people start at the wrong end of love they start with the love of, you know, a man or, or, or any other thing like that. Well, in, in the sense that, you know, we all get, you know, for better or for worse or for worse and worse, we, we do get trapped in these gender identities, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is something so extraordinary about Carson is I feel like in the same sense that she has this open heart and open perception and open ability to empathize and understand, you know, people outside of her background, her race, her age, her, mm -hmm. she also has this extraordinary ability to kind of, I feel like sit in a, in a kind of non-gender conforming place mm -hmm. where, you know, she's, she's open to the humanity mm -hmm. of us all, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I look forward to a time and when, you know, so many of these things dissolve and we don't, you know, we aren't so identified with ourselves as either male or female or mm. old or young, or, you know, I feel like we've, we, we do live in a culture that holds on to this stuff for dear life as though it has something to do with who we are. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, that one of the things that excites me about her writing is that it, it sort of defies these things. It, it, they just, they almost dissolve and fall away when you, when you enter her mind or her perception. It doesn't feel like she's holding on to, you know, she's searching for who she is perhaps, but not needing to identify with it and grasp onto it. Mm -hmm. Can I say something about that, Nick, as well? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only does, I think, uh, Carson show us a model in the Battle of the Sad Cafe of love, for lack of a better word, and that's the word she uses in the, in the novel uh, so often, how it, it sort of transcends uh, uh, gender with this sort of triangular relationship between Marvin Macy, Cousin Lyman, and Miss Amelia. Um, but also she provides us the cipher as well in the, you know, maybe the most famous passage of all of her, uh, all of her work, the uh, uh, the uh, lover and beloved uh, passage. Right. Um, you know, now is the time for us to uh, speak of love, if that's uh, how the passage uh, begins. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where she tries to, uh, you know, uh, describe her philosophy of uh, of love. In that yeah, passage. and she basically says, and I had you uh, point out the page number to me, and thank you for doing that. I was just rereading it, and I mean, she she basically says there to me, my reading of it is. You know, love is unpredictable and ungovernable. Ungover you know, um, it, it, it can uh, anyone can fall in love with anyone else. And it, you, you almost imagine that um, if she were writing that today, she would go further with that. I mean, she, she basically uh, allows readers to keep it in the realm of heterosexual love. Right. But but says basically any man can fall in love with any woman or any woman can fall in love with any man. But she also writes it in such a way as you can you can read between the lines and say she's saying anyone can fall in love with anyone else. Right. Yeah. And that's unpredictable and ungovernable. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I want to ask one more question, and that is, um, what do you think is going to be the the legacy of Carson McCullers. And Jen, why don't we start with you? What, what, what do you think will be 
um, the thing that is her biggest uh, and most lasting influence? Well, I think that's a little bit of an impossible question. Um, and, and it's hard for me to say when, when, when I was thinking about the question of her influence, I immediately thought of the writers that came immediately to my mind who I know have been influenced by her work or who it appears to me have been. I mean, I can see so many Frankies marching through the pages of contemporary fiction from Donna Tartt's Little Friend, Zizi Packer's Short Story Brownies, Joy Williams' The Quick and the Dead. I can see her influence on so many fiction writers that I really admire, like Elizabeth McCracken, who's written about McCullers, Eileen Miles, C. Pam Zhang. There, there are so many different people uh, who I think are kind of channeling her work uh, into contemporary fiction, which is so exciting. But influence is a, is a tricky uh, tricky thing to pin down. And I, I think it would be hard to, hard for me to say kind of what that influence will be, you know, going forward in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I just hope that her influence grows. Like I, like I said at the beginning, I didn't read McCullers when I was in high school. I didn't read her when I was in college, even though I studied literature that whole time. Um, and, and I think it would really do the world a lot of good if more people were reading her work. So I hope mm -hmm. that is her legacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you have thoughts on that? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with what Chen just said. I mean, I hope that, you know, more and more people, I mean, I've had such an extraordinary experience taking this film around when we were several years taking it to film festivals and stuff. And, and it's been extraordinary to realize that there's an awful lot of people out there who don't know her work. They know of her, they know her name, they know something about her, but they're, you know, they've never sat down and read Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And, and, and then the people who also have read her work, who were equally as moved by her, mm -hmm. um, are changed. Like people who really feel like their life turned when they mm -hmm. read Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And so, you know, I, I think from my perspective, you know, she did something and, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't know the whole world of literature, but from my experience as a female writer writing in the time in which she wrote, she shook, <laughs> she shook up the world. Mm -hmm. She did something, you know, that will, it will go on, you know, through, you know, the people that were influenced by her. But I think I hope people just continue to come back to the source mm -hmm. and read her. She has a small body of work, but it's a very powerful body of work. Yeah. And, right. um, you know, no matter who she has influenced going forward, I think, you know, people will continue to go back to these books and these short stories and these poems and, and continue to discover her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carlos. I, hope I'm not suddenly like a broken uh, record, but this uh, this idea of empathy that I'm sort of stuck on at the moment uh, in relation uh, to uh, her work, that, you know, there, uh, you know, a writer who sets out, and I'm not sure she did this consciously at all. I just think it was so important to her, uh, not only to have, find people in her own life who could be empathetic toward her, but her desire to provide that to other uh, other people. Uh, it comes out in her work so that everywhere I look now in her work, uh, either from the most outlandish characters, and that's a word she uses uh, in describing, you know, the objects of love or the people who are loved mm -hmm. in her famous passage in the Battle of Sad Cafe, she uses the word the outlandishness. Uh <laughs> Even the most outlandish person can be the object, uh, the, the inspiration for love. Um, her showing us these, uh, these sort of wild models of... Uh, of people we should be empathetic uh, toward. And she she sort of comes at it from so many different angles because that's one of the reasons you know, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, I think is her great masterpiece is because she takes on all these different characters and shows in the end how they're all deserving and in need of, uh, of love is one way to put it, but empathy is another way uh, uh, to put it. And I think you know, the world certainly needs more of that uh, every day. Uh, I don't see it needing any less of it, uh, certainly than the time she was writing uh, these books. 
And so this idea of, of uh, empathy, and I had this idea for a book I might want to write about sort of the stylistics of empathy to look at her work, almost take her, take her work apart and see how on earth she was able to manage this, uh, to instill this idea, or to teach uh, her readers uh, empathy. And people who respond really strongly to her work, I think that's what we're responding to, is this identification with this desire or need for empathy that she's providing us by showing us how to be um, uh, empathetic toward other people. That's certainly what I've come to realize is what I respond so strongly. It's this identification with her modeling of empathy toward these uh, these disparate characters in her, in her work. That's not a bad legacy to have if it is hers. Right. And, and I think that is sort of what Sarah Shulman says in that piece, right, is that she's yeah. a model for us in that regard. And it's what Richard Wright said. You know, in that famous review that he wrote, and he said she's the first white Southern writer who has the same sort of empathy for her black characters as she does for her white characters. And so and it is an amazing thing, isn't it? Well, I I have the luxury of giving the house tour, which I know you've done as well, Carlos, um, here at the at the house in Columbus. And I have given the tour to people from all over the world. And that is something to me that speaks to her legacy. The fact that she connects with people all around the world. I have had people uh, from from Asia, from uh, all over Europe, from all over uh, North and South America. I've had people when I take them into the bedroom and I say, this is the room uh, that this was Carson McCullers's room when she was a little girl and they start weeping and they apologize to me. But they said it just means so much to me. And to me, that says something about her legacy right there. So, um, Adam, um, would you like uh, for us to answer some questions or would you like to open the uh, floor to questions from our audience? Well, let's see if we have some some questions from from okay. the um from people in the audience you can either put questions in the chat or i suppose you could raise your hands and we can call on you that way too okay yeah i see that someone has put that in the in the uh, chat box hi carlos greetings from minneapolis oh. <laughs> <laughs> well is there anyone who would like to ask a question no one has mentioned her parents. That's from NN. That's from Nick Norwood. <laughs> Some other Nick Norwood. Um, uh, Carlos, you know a good deal about um, Carson's parents. What, what would you say is the influence of her parents on, uh, on her life and work? Well, you know, there's an imbalance, I think, in the influence between her, her two parents, because I think her mother was wildly uh, influential uh, on her, both in, you know, lots of positive ways in the nurturing that she provided, but also in the sort of legacy of her dependence on her mother actually has this sort of dark side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, she has a uh, one of her short stories. Um, is it called Instead of the Hour After or... Uh, oh, you gosh. don't mean... It you don't mean no, a domestic no, dilemma, not that no, one. It's no, it's the one where where the um, uh, young boy's uh, mother has attempted suicide, and he's oh, come yes, home and mean. found her. And uh, uh, now, whenever he returns home, she survives the suicide attempt. And, and now, every time he returns home, he's afraid to go inside his uh, house because he's afraid she might have uh, done this again. And there's a the narrator uh, uh, says of him uh, during that story, we hate those we have to need so badly. Mm. And I think it's one of the, it's a crucial line uh, for Carson in understanding her mother and this sort of complicated relationship with had, she had with the mother because she was so dependent on her mother, but there are very few mothers in her work. So many of her characters uh, don't have mothers uh, in her work because I think her mother was so important to her that it was easier for her to avoid writing about it or trying to capture her mother or mother characters in her uh, in her work because she had such complicated feelings. In some ways, I'm making a leap here, but mm -hmm. in some ways, her relationship to her mother uh, and its complicated nature was similar to her relationship to uh, Columbus, Georgia, in that she took it with her everywhere she went. Uh, she couldn't escape it. She was greatly indebted to it, but very ambivalent about it. And I think it's mm -hmm. the same way uh, in relation to her mother. Her father is this sort of, you know, sad uh, uh, character in a way because, you know, he uh, 
worked so much and was out of the house so much, his children didn't really have much of a relationship uh, with their uh, with their father. Um, and so he is just like um, uh, uh, Frankie Adams' father in uh, the member of the wedding. He's just this figure who sort of appears every evening you have a meal with, but otherwise he doesn't have that much influence on his life. And I'm afraid I think that's what Carson's father's uh, influence was uh, on uh, on her. Yeah. But you know, bless him for coming up with the uh, the money to uh, send her to New York because that really changed everything for her. It was that place she was able to get away to that changed everything uh, for her. Right. Well, and he also gave her uh, fictional father something to do. They were watch repairmen and, and jewelry shop owners. And I right. remember the wedding and the heart is only hundred. I think I've always thought that was interesting because as you say, her mother was such a, a, a much bigger part of her life. Yeah. Um, we have someone from Georgia College and State University asking, why do you think the Carson and Flannery O'Connor had such a distaste for each other, which I have always, I mean, I have my thoughts about this, but um, uh, many of you, you may know that um, uh, Flannery O'Connor wrote a review of Carson's last book and said it's the worst book I ever read, which seems just nasty and also unfair. But um, yeah, they 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 well and well and Carson thought that Flannery O'Connor had basically like uh, Harper Lee and other Southern writers been ripping her off. Um, so I don't know. Uh, any any thoughts on that? I have one thought, uh, mm -hmm. which is that recently. Uh, the New Yorker published uh, an article talking about Flannery O'Connor's letters. Mm -hmm. um, and what comes through from that article and, and apparently from the letters, which I have not read, um, were that is that Flannery O'Connor had a lot of pretty racist ideas that she mm -hmm. held throughout her life um, and that she voiced pretty openly. And she used a lot of racist slurs and language in her letters. Um, and so based on what we've talked about with Carson McCullers and her work and her stance on race relations and, and how, uh, how openly she wrote about that, I can't imagine it was easy for the two of them to find common ground. Yeah. Uh, but the same, the same thing kind of goes um, for that review of Clock Without Hands, because that book is about interracial relationships. Um, and that book is about... Uh, racialized violence and, and KKK violence. So you can see how it wouldn't necessarily resonate with a, a reader like Flannery O'Connor, but that's, that's just kind of some new archival uh, things that have leaked out that I, I find interesting for thinking about their relationship. Mm -hmm. Karen, I remember you saying to me that when we were discussing um, um uh, who, who's the most famous writer in Georgia? You were surprised for me to say that I thought probably Flannery O'Connor was more famous than Carson McCullers. And you said, what? And so, <laughs> <laughs> what, well, what, I, what made you, know, you say that? I, you know, I just don't, you know, it's interesting. I, I just don't know her work that well. And I don't, I think the little bit of her work I have read, I was not that drawn to it. So, mm -hmm. um, but I remember when when we had a trio rocket cloud and we were taking you around to film festivals, mm -hmm. um, we I was really shocked, and I think we talked about this a little bit. How there were some festivals in the eastern part of Georgia that turned down the film, and and mm -hmm. I I just thought. Why would they? Why would they turn down this film? And I remember saying to one of the festivals, "This is your daughter. Yeah. You know, this is your. Yeah. You know, this is the your the yeah. great Georgia writer." And somebody said in a very snipey, snippy sort of way to me, "Flannery O'Connor is our daughter. You know, is is wow. our daughter, daughter." And I thought. Okay, but you mean it's an either or kind of you can't have you yeah. can't have two daughters. Yeah. You know? But it was sort of like if they were gonna embrace Carson somehow or other, it was there was some sort of demarcation line there. Well, you know it surprised um, me and I had no idea. I didn't know much about the Yeah. The, well, Flannery O'Connor, even though she was Roman Catholic she did embrace organized religion. I mean, her whole work is based on it. And I, I don't know. I wonder if maybe that is why some Georgians um, would embrace Flannery O'Connor when they might not embrace Carson McCullers. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know. I, what, what do you think about that, Carlos? Do you, do you think uh, maybe that's part of the no, there, problem? That's, I think it's even broader than uh, simply organized religion. It's sort of establishment, you could say, yeah. that Flannery O'Connor was much more of a, a, despite how unorthodox in some ways she was and in unorthodox some of her work was and it's sort of more gothic uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, she played the game and followed the rules. Uh, in a way that Carson never would and never did and couldn't tolerate. Um, yeah. So one was an out, you know, one had stepped outside of the system and the other was sort of happy to remain within it uh, and be a bit radical from within. And the other simply uh, didn't want to play the game. And yeah. so uh, you can see why Carson would be the one that would be uh, rejected and the other be somewhat embraced. Yeah. Yeah. And Jen here, I think is a good question for you. Uh, it says uh, Carson's great subject was love. Does anyone have an opinion on who Carson's great love was? Uh, I think based on the research I did, I'd have to say Mary Mercer, uh, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Um, uh, and More so than, than uh, Anne-Marie uh, Clorox Schwarzenbach, you think? I think so. Yeah. Um, because of because of what I read in the the letters and in the therapy transcripts at Columbus, um, and because of the you know in excess of fifty different little cards that accompany flowers um, that Carson sent to Mary, it's kind of inarguable, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Carlos or Karen, do you guys have yeah, any I, thought on that? Yeah, I, uh, I I think I agree with uh, with Jen. In that um, Carson's life, uh, you know, it, it somewhat tragically was was a search for sort of parody in love, or was a search for reciprocity uh, in love, mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe too much is made of the sort of tragic nature of that, and you know, the various people throughout her life that she was in love with who didn't return it. And I say that's why I would say Anna Marie Clorox Schwarzenbach was not uh, you know the great love of her. She was certainly. Mm -hmm madly in love with Anna Marie Clark Schwarzenbach, but it wasn't mutual, uh, uh, very mutual, let's say, and that was heartbreaking uh, for her. But Dr. Mercer was a different story. There was this sort of mutuality of respect and love uh, and affection between the two of them that may be the only time Carson encountered that in her life. And of course, unfortunately, it was just the last eight years of her, uh, her life that that was the case. But, you know, bless her for finally uh, having that toward the end of her life. Um, and it made all the difference. I think she would have died in maybe 1958 or 1959 if she hadn't uh, met uh, Dr. Mercer. I think she gave her the gift of almost a decade of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Karen, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or if you would have a... a no, not a, really. I don't, you know, having not uh, read the, the letters and stuff, I don't really have a, a, a yeah. very strong sense of that private part of her life. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, are there any other final thoughts that you would like to share about Carson McCullers then before we go, Karen? Oh, oh well, Nick, I, I'm sorry. I think, before you know, I forget, there's one question in the oh, okay. Q&A yeah. too, don't okay. All right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I missed it. Where's that? It's in the Q&A, not in the chat. Oh, oh okay. Ah, the Q&A. Uh, Jen, you describe so movingly your experience of living in Carson's Columbus house and your absorbing autobiography of Carson McCullers. I have a whole new appreciation for the clothing we all wear. Could you speak to the way Carson's environment affected your reading of her fiction? Um, yeah, I, I think with, in terms of the clothing, which you mentioned, um, cataloging her clothes at the Ransom Center gave me, I felt like a total, totally new insight into, uh, into aspects of her life that didn't come through in other parts of the archive in, in any of the published work. Um, and, and those were, you know, insights about her illness and kind of how she carried herself, but also about her fashion and her style, um, that were amazing. Um, and if, if, anyone in the audience has not Google image searched Carson McCullers, you absolutely should to see some of these outfits. Um, but, and so that was, you know, hugely impactful on my thinking about her and, and my interest in her. Um, but the house itself um, had, I mean, as I'm sure I, the other panelists could attest, it's, it has uh, a very strong uh, feeling and a very strong feeling of history um, and it's hard, it's hard not to kind of fall down the rabbit hole of imagining scenes from her books 
in the house. Uh, and I even caught myself doing that, imagining that kitchen scene and member of the wedding taking place in the kitchen in the house. But then of course, having to remind myself, well, things about the house have changed. And I don't know what of the house was even here at that time. Um, and I don't know if she was imagining this kitchen when she wrote about it, but it's just so easy mm -hmm. uh, when you're in a space like that to start, to start making those conflations. Um, yeah. But yeah. And, and then just kind of the, uh, the climate of Columbus, the humidity, the pollen, things like that. Just, you know, what, what someone mentioned about, you know, what flowers grow there and when do they grow? It, it was kind of being able to see that, being able to see the magnolia tree outside the window um, and, and just feel like I had a, a glimpse into uh, where she spent her formative years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts then, Jen, that you would want to share? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'll cut you off, Karen. What were you going to say? Oh, the only thing, you know, that that I think had jumped into my my thinking was, you know, just another because we were talking themes and, and some of these sort of beautiful themes, just remembering um, a theme that runs throughout The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, which really has to do with connection, like when two people connect and that sort of feeling that she had that that pe there are certain people who are meant to make a connection. And, and, and yeah, it wasn't related to gender or race or any, any sort of uh, common, uh, necessarily anything that would, commonality. It was mm -hmm. just that it was almost like she writes about souls, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. souls that are meant to make a connection with each other. And um, it, it just seems to be such a strong theme that she has that that um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, it, she's she speaks for a lot of of us who who also feel these things, but we just have never been able to really quite articulate articulate yeah. it as clearly and as beautifully as yeah. she does. No, I, I agree completely. And I, I feel that is her big theme, right? This, this, uh, this, this need to connect this, this drive to connect. And, and it's what drove her, it seems to me. And it's, it's the big theme that runs through that book and, and all of her work. Yeah. Um, Carlos, do you have uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah. Well, picking up on something that uh, Karen just said, that, that these connections that Carson you know, shows us happening uh, and that she uh, valued so much between, uh, between people. Um, by reading her work, you can have that same connection with her. And it's interesting that some people respond so strongly uh, to, her, uh, to her work, uh, shows that sort of inaction you know, across time via her pages. So, you know, we're hosted by a library tonight. We're uh, here thanks to uh, the generosity of someone who clearly uh, cared a great deal about reading and encouraging people to read uh, great literature. I would just like to end by saying if there's anyone who's uh, watching us who hasn't read Carson's work, to please do so, because you never know, you might have the same kind of sort of uh, electric response that I had when I first read her or other people have had uh, when they first uh, first read her. So if, if anything can come from our conversation today, uh, uh, I would like it to be people to be inspired to uh, continue to read and share her work. Yes, and stay tuned for the collected letters of Carson McCullers, which Carlos Dews is currently working on editing. When, to, when are we going to see that, Carlos? When do you think that'll be? I wish you hadn't asked me that, Nick. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they will probably be, be, out, be out sometime in 2024. Okay. All right. Will be published. And if you haven't already, read uh, Jen Chaplin's book, My Autobiography of Cars McCullers, uh, finalist for the National Book Award. And you can go to uh, various places now. I think it's called Canva. Isn't that right, Karen? And you can Can see... Canopy. Canopy, canopy, canopy. Thank you. Yes, yeah. canopy, and see the beautiful film "A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud," directed by Karen Allen, and also a screenplay adapted from the short story by Karen Allen. So, mm. and it's wonderful. Okay, Adam, I think we've answered all I the will. questions, haven't we? Yes, and I'm going to pop in here. This okay. is I'll turn my video on. Hello again, everyone, and I just. Thought that was fabulous. I really do. I'm, I feel like your souls are all connected <laughs> in the same way that Karen mentioned that uh, 
our author tonight was connected. And um, Nick, you did a fabulous job um, moderating. And anytime you want to moderate one of our <laughs> one of our literary sessions, please please feel free to. And thank you all so much for coming. And thanks to our audience. We can't see, but we know you're out there. <laughs> and um, I just want to say thanks. And I hope that we'll be able to meet again sometime. And I, I have a long list of Carson McCullers things to read. She was one of my heroes, just like Karen's in high school back in the early 70s. And I reread um, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. I was just blown away. It was, it was you know, 50 years, so a long time. But um, she's just an amazing writer. So thank you again. And have a great night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks. Carlos, are you in Rome? I am. You are? <laughs> How, what's the feeling over there? Is, are you feeling awfully close to the madness? Well, it is. It's, uh, you know, it feels like it's right next door, uh, uh, to, to be honest. And, you know, we have Ukrainian, stu Ukrainian students here at the university, and there's a very large U Ukrainian uh, community here in, uh, in Italy, uh, especially here in Rome. So, yeah, I mean, people are coming together and people are doing fundraisers and doing all kinds of things. And luckily, uh, Italy at the, uh, uh, is very generous in accepting refugees into the country. So they've already agreed to host a huge number of, uh, of uh, because there's so many family members here already, um, they're, they're letting anyone who's here, who's Ukrainian, to sponsor their entire families to come if they want. So we have a lot of people coming in uh, uh, at the moment. So, uh, yeah. So it does, it feels, it feels too close, to be honest. Yeah. I'm going to sign off, but it was great seeing you all. Okay. Great seeing you, Carlos. Take care. Take care. Great seeing you, Karen. Thank Thanks you so much. Again. Bye, Thank Jen. you, Nick. Okay. okay. Bye.